you would, take your Bibles and let's turn them to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We'll start there in just a few minutes this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. There's a beautiful statement here in the book of Ecclesiastes written by the one to whom God had given much wisdom, a writer that gives us assurance that although we are facing the end of our life, that there is something more, something greater in which we can place our confidence. He says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we'll read that first and then we'll bring the chart up. He says in verse 6, Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the will broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. This gives us great confidence, knowing that when we die, that while our physical body will go through the process of decomposition, that as soon as our body ceases to function, that our spirit is in the hand of the Lord. It gives us, as his people, great confidence to recognize and to believe that we have an eternal home that has been prepared for us. The Bible gives us hope, gives us great hope regarding this eternal home, eternal life. We already looked at part of it in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 6 through 7 here, that our spirit will go back to God. Even though our body may be buried here, it may be buried there, or it may be lost at sea, wherever it may be, it doesn't matter. Because as soon as we leave this mortal body, this carnal body, that as soon as we leave it, we are in the hands of our Heavenly Father. It is a very comforting thought, although when you think about what Jesus is saying in regards to the story of rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, 22, he makes a statement in regard to Lazarus when he died that the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. Just that thought alone, to know that while even if I were to die alone on this earth, I won't be alone that I will return back to my Heavenly Father. I will go to Him. Now, Jesus, in His teachings, He talks about this everlasting life and to whom this everlasting life belongs. Notice with me in John chapter 6. Let's look first at verse 40. John chapter 6, verse 40. Jesus, as He's talking to the multitude here, He talks about the significance of believing in Him. And you'll notice here, he says in John 6, verse 40, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread of life which came down from heaven. Back up to verse 40, that was 41. He says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees that, sorry, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have everlasting life. This is what he's telling his disciples and those who came to hear him. Now, in, a course, in the course of this conversation, he will say things that will be difficult for some people, and as a result, some will leave because they don't have had, they did not have the belief in him that they needed. Look over in John chapter 11. Again, he talks about this. Let's start our reading there in verse 24 of John chapter 11. This time in a conversation with Martha in regards to Lazarus, the brother, not the same one in, that we referenced in Luke 16, 22. But in this case, Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, he had died. And so Jesus goes to her and she says to Jesus there, after Jesus says, your brother will rise again, she says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives, believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? And to that question, she then stated, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So Jesus gives us the hope of everlasting life if we will believe in him. 
But the question that sometimes we may wonder is what will be the form of this eternal life? And I think that's a good question. The Bible gives us a little bit of an answer to the question, and it is a sufficient answer, but it's also a very glorious answer. To look at this, we need to remember a simple principle that whatever is sown is different from that which is reaped. Let me say that again, if I can say it a little more clearly. That which is sown is not the same thing as that which is reaped. Okay, here's why we make that statement. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's start our reading beginning in verse 35. He says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? He says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. So what did he say? Well, boiling it down, he said, whatever you, what you sow is not the same thing as you reap. Okay. Think about that for just a moment. If you are going to plant okra, what you'll do is plant the okra seed. Now, where does the okra seed come from? Well, it comes from the okra, but they don't look alike, do they? The okra seed looks nothing like the okra. That's a simple concept. Let's, let's throw a few cucumbers into the mix as well. I don't know if you'd eat okras and cucumber together. I guess you could try to fry them. But cucumber seeds, do they look anything like the cucumber? In principle, they do not. Okay? And that's the, same, that's the point he's trying to make here. Let's look at that again. He says, And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. Let's throw in there our illustration. Sow that body that shall be, but mere okra, mere cucumber. Okay? It's the seed of that which is planted. He says, But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. So there's a difference. Whatever is sown is not going to look like what comes from the harvest. All right, it's a simple concept. And we know this through farming, through planting, even through something as in dealing with flowers. It's the same idea. When our bodies are buried within the ground, when they are sown, what is raised from that is not in the same form. It's not the same thing. Let's come back to our text a little more, though, and then we'll continue forward. He says back in, then in verse 38, But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animal, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. In other words, God has given to everything the form that he would have for it, and there are times when things are planted that the form of what is planted is not the same form as that which is harvested. Now, that concept in mind, let's go a little further here with this. Start our reading now beginning in verse 42. He says, so also is a resurrection of the dead. All right, so everything that he said in the example of talking about what is sown is different than what is reaped. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. He says, the body is sown in corruption. He says, it is raised in incorruption. Our natural body is sown in corruption. Now, he could be talking about sin. We, we live in very sinful bodies. But the general idea here is our body dies. Our body decays. Our body is that which is corruptible, and over the course of time, once it ceases to function, the body breaks down. The natural body is sown in corruption. But then what is the other side? What is reaped? We sow the natural body, if you would, in the context of this. What is reaped? What is harvested, if, if you would, kind of following that analogy here, he says, the body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. 
And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, notice what he says here, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So we sow the natural body when we die, and our spiritual body is raised incorruptible. We bear the image now of Adam, of the sinful man. But the time will come, we will bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, he's talking about in the context here of the resurrection. This is what he's building up to. Now, a lot of what we're looking at, we can also track back to being spiritually raised from the dead. When we're talking about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, we who are dead in our trespasses and sins, God has made us alive through Jesus Christ. There is that spiritual resurrection that takes place when one is born again. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. Therefore, like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we too should also walk in the newness of life, Ephesians 6, or Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. There is that spiritual resurrection there. But he's talking about the resurrection after we die. He's talking about the what will come later. There were people in Corinth who were saying there is no resurrection. And they they were talking about not the spiritual resurrection as he explains in in Ephesians 2. They were saying there's no resurrection of the dead. And so Paul is teaching them in 1 Corinthians 15 the folly of their argument. And fundamentally what it boils down to, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ was not raised from the dead. And if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then what are we doing here? Those are my words. They said, we of all men are most pitiable. So in the context here, he is talking about what some were saying was not going to happen. He says it is going to happen. There is going to be a resurrection of the dead. And so in the course of this, he explains we have to die in order to be raised again. We have to sow that natural body in order to have to reap the spiritual body. We have to sow the corruptible body in order to reap the incorruptible body. We are now in the image of sinful man Adam. One day we will be in the image of the heavenly man it's a beautiful thought and it's a beautiful promise that we have here and it gives us hope that one day our mortal will become immortal okay remember what hope is we're talking about hope from the scriptural standpoint it's an earnest expectation it's something that you hope for because you believe the promises of the one who said that it would take place The hope serves as an anchor to our soul. We will be raised incorruptible. We look forward to that great and glorious day. Let's look now at the remainder of this chapter, beginning now in verse 50. Paul then continues in this context to say, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Notice that. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There are religions who teach that that there will be a physical eternity, meaning that 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 all the bad people will be taken away and, and, and we will have an eternal life in the physical form. He says, notice what he said here, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. That's an established fact in biblical principle. One more time. He says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. But then he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Paul believed this. He believed that when the Lord comes again, that the dead will be raised incorruptible and we, those who are living, shall be changed. And then notice what else he says. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, 
then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What does it mean death is swallowed up in victory? Death is fully defeated. Nothing to fear. Nothing to worry about. Because it's simply a moment of transition from this corruptible body into an incorruptible body where we will be eternally with our Heavenly Father. This mortal must put on this immortality. Death shall be swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? In other words, death has no sting. Hades has no victory. The only thing he says about that, though, is the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you go back to verse 54, we've already seen that victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Because of Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross of Calvary, our mortal bodies will one day be an immortal body. In other words, we shall be changed from something that is corruptible to that which is incorruptible. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, let's deviate from 1 Corinthians 15 to go over to, uh, turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Paul talks about this to the brethren in Philippi, and I like the wording he uses here. Put it in conjunction with just what we've already read. But in Philippians chapter 3, note there with me in verse 20. We could go back up to verse 17, but I want to start in verse 20. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So what's going to happen? He says that our lowly, he says he will, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be, be conformed to what? His glorious body. That's the promise of the scriptures. That when the Lord comes again, whether we have already died, if we have, we'll rise with him. Or if we are still living and he comes again, we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to have the same image as the glorious body of Jesus Christ. And then one more passage. Note with me, if you would, 1 John 3. Some may ask, and I have asked this question because I think it's a very interesting and amazing question. What will we be like? We have some few statements. We will be conformed to his glorious body. That's a wonderful thing. We will be transformed. That We will come from mortal, we'll put on immortality and take the corruption and put on incorruption. But what will that be like? Well, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. He will transform us so that we will be conformed to his glorious body. And that's what John means here when he says, that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This gives us incredible hope. You know, it's easy, especially when you are young, and you're looking at a full life ahead of you, it's easy to lose sight of the brevity of life. Because you look ahead of you, and when you're 20 years old, if you happen to live to 80, that's a solid 60 years ahead of you. And if you happen to live to 90, then that's a solid 70 years ahead of you. Seems like a long time, especially when you're starting a family. And you've got one child, and then another child comes along, and then maybe a third one, maybe perhaps a fourth one. 
you know, and depending on how you have them set up there, they, they are, they are a, a, a sign to you of how long life is until they grow up and you get older. Then you begin to realize how short life is. And the older you get, the shorter it becomes. And so through the course of this, instead of, get, instead of getting so caught up in this life, we simply live it in service unto God, knowing that one day, and every day we get closer to it, that one day we will be able to step over the threshold of death to eternity with our God in heaven, to something far more glorious and wonderful than we could ever begin to imagine. The big question is, when is this going to happen? Well, John tells us in verse 3, or verse 2 of what we just read, he says, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, that's when it's going to happen, when Jesus is revealed. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, this is the passage that we used for our scripture reading earlier. Here we see Paul, this time to the church in Thessalonica, saying essentially the same thing. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you saw as others who have no hope. Talking about those Christians who have already died. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Look at that again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So when the Lord comes again, those who have already died, the, they are not going to be held by the bonds of grave. They're not going to be held by the bonds of death. He says here in the text that when, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Notice that, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That may be what he's talking about when he said there in verse 14, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Okay? And then he says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. With who? He says, with the dead in Christ. Notice that. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Then he says, comfort one another with these words. So the answer to the question is, when will we be transformed? When the Lord comes again. When the Lord is revealed, when that time comes where he will bring with him those who have already died and those who are living will rise up to meet him in the air. Those events will take place when the Lord comes again. The transformation we're talking about being conformed to his glorious body, going from corruptible to incorruptible and all that, we're looking forward to it being fulfilled when the Lord comes again, when the Lord is revealed. Now, there are one thing I want you, I need us to remember, and this goes back to what we're talking about to the younger people earlier as you go up through life. Please always remember that this life is temporary. Again, the younger you are, the harder it is to fully appreciate how temporary our life is. But the older you get, the more it begins to dawn on us that this physical life is temporary. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's turn over there for just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's look there at verses 16 through 18. He says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You catch that? The things which are seen, they are temporary. But the things that are not seen, 
they are the ones that, those are the things that are eternal. And those are the things that we are living for. He then says in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You know, Paul talks about being converted from, a, from a corruptible to incorruption. But here he paints the picture that it's more than simply our individual self. He's talking about that which we become a part of. For we know that if our earthly house is sin is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Notice that mortality, swallowed up by life. This is life in Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Who has prepared us for this very thing, for this transition, for this, this, this being conformed? Who has prepared us for this? Well, the text says God has. So we are always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We have waiting for us a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And when the Lord comes again, when the Lord reveals himself, then we see the end of all things and the eternity beginning with God in heaven. One day we will be raised incorruptible. That time will come. We believe that from the scriptures. And one day we'll be conformed to the glorious body of Jesus Christ. We believe that and we serve him faithfully. We walk by faith, not by sight. We'll have an eternal body. We'll have, view it as an eternal life, better yet view it as an eternal home in heaven. If you're not a Christian, you need to obey the gospel's call into salvation. There's the invitation to come. The spirit and the bride says, come. Come to the Lord today. Make the decision to obey the gospel's call into salvation. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, then listen to him, repent of your sins, and be buried with him in baptism. So you'll rise it then to walk in the newness of life and live faithfully and you'll have eternal life with him in heaven, laying up for yourself treasures in the wonderful glories of our Lord and Savior. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully, then what, why have you walked away from it? It's time to repent and come back to him today so that when he comes again, you will have eternity with him in heaven. If you accept to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.